In this video, we're going to do an example problem that involves two masses. So you see here that we have a mass two moving down an incline, and this is actually a frictionless incline here. Mass two is attached to a string. The string goes along parallel to the incline and then over a pulley and then connects to a mass M1. So as mass two moves down the incline, that string is going to move mass one to the right along the horizontal surface. There is friction between mass one and the surface below. We're also going to assume that this is a massless pulley And by assuming that this is a massless pulley, we are basically allowed to assume that we have a constant tension throughout the string. And this allows us to focus our analyses on mass one and mass two and not really worry much about the effects of the pulley. Okay, anyways, we're going to solve this problem using the same handout that we've been using to apply the first condition of equilibrium. However, this time we're going to apply that process separately to mass one and to mass two. Let's get started. Let's go to mass one and draw a dashed line around mass one. And then we're gonna to come to the side here, make a copy of mass one and onto that copy of mass one, we're going to put in our force diagram. Okay, now here I would encourage you to pause the video and see if you can follow the steps on the handout on your own to make the force diagram for mass one. All right, so as usual, we're going to start by drawing in the gravitational force vector, which points down. So let's call that G1 to distinguish from the gravitational force vector on mass two. And I'll put in the magnitude, M1G. And then as usual, we're going to go around the dashed line and we're going to see where things are reaching in through the dashed line to exert forces on mass one. And we can see here that the horizontal surface cuts in through the dashed line to exert forces on mass one. So that horizontal surface will exert a normal force Again, we use the one subscript because there will also be a normal force acting on mass two. The horizontal surface also exerts a frictional force on mass one, pointing back to the left. So we have FK, kinetic friction force. And then we have the string reaching in to pull on mass one. So for that, I'll put the tension force pointing to the right like so. We'll call that tension force one because there's a tension force acting on mass two as well. Okay, um, now before we put in all of the magnitudes, I want to do the same exercise for mass two. So for mass two, we start as usual by drawing a dashed line around mass two and then making a clean copy of mass two off to the side. And as before, then, and as before, I'd encourage you to pause the video here and try and make the force diagram for mass two on your own before you see what I do. Okay, so gravitational force. Call that G2. Okay, now as we go around the dashed line here, we see that the incline is coming in through the dashed line to exert a force on mass two. Now this incline is frictionless. So in this case, 
we have only the normal force. And we'll call that N2. And we also have the tension in the string pulling up along the incline. So I'm going to call that tension force two. And there we go. Okay, so now let's go through and put in the magnitudes. So for normal force one, just put in N1. The magnitude of this kinetic friction force between mass one and the surface below is the strength of the normal force acting between those two objects. In other words, I'm going to put in the kinetic friction force as mu k times n1. Now, over here for mass two, gravitational force two magnitude would be m2g for normal force n2 magnitude n2. Now, as for the tension, we have tension force T1 and tension force T2, and there might be a temptation to say that the magnitude of this is T1 and the magnitude of this is T2, but in fact, we have the same tension throughout the string, and because we have the same tension throughout the string, the magnitudes of those two tension forces are equal, so I will call this one capital T and this one also capital T. Okay, so going back to the handout, we have just completed step two on the handout. Uh, now step three is to introduce Cartesian coordinate systems. We're going to do this for each of the masses, right? It's perfectly fine to give each mass its own coordinate system. So for each of the masses, we're going to pick the orientation of our X and Y axes so that as many vectors as possible line up with an axis. Now, if you look at mass one, you can see clearly that we want to choose standard orientation with x-axis to the right and y-axis pointing up. All right. Um, okay, y-axis pointing up. X-axis pointing to the right. Okay, so let's go ahead and make the grid and fill it out with the x and y components. So this would be another great place for you to pause and try to do this on your own before you come back in to see what I do. All right, so we have four mass one, we have gravitational force one, tension one, normal force one, and then the friction force. For each of these, we want the X and Y components. Now, for each of these vectors, now each of these vectors lines up exactly along one of the axes, which means that for each of the vectors, there is one component that's zero. So for the gravitational force, it is the x component, which is zero. The y component is minus m1g. For tension one, the y component is zero. The x component is t. For normal force one, we have zero and one. And for kinetic friction force, y component is zero, x component is minus mu k n one. All right, now let's do mass two. So for mass two, uh, again, I'd encourage you to pause the video and try to do this on your own before you see how I do. Now let's go to mass two, and as usual, we want to find an alignment of the axes so that as many vectors as possible line up with one of the axes. So here we can rotate our axes so that the y-axis is perpendicular to the incline and the x-axis points down the incline. So let me come into the figure here. So here is our x-axis. Here's our y-axis. 
Now, in this case, the only vector which is not aligned on an axis is the gravitational force vector. So the gravitational force vector, in an earlier video, I showed you how to find the angle that the gravitational force vector makes with the minus y direction. And it turned out that the angle that the gravitational force vector makes with the minus y direction is the same as the angle of the incline. So I'm just gonna put in that theta there for 40 degrees. Okay, so now let's make the grid. So the next step is to make the grid into which we will enter the X and Y components of all of the vectors. And at this point, I would encourage you to pause the video and try that on your own before you see what I do. All right, so for mass two, we have gravitational force two, normal force two, tension two, and we need X and Y components. Okay, so for gravitational force two, uh, let's do the Y component first. So I will project onto the minus Y axis. So then this would be my Y component of the gravitational force. So notice that it falls along the minus Y direction. So I put in a minus sign followed by the magnitude M2G. And now since that Y component is adjacent to the theta, I'm going to use cosine theta here. Okay, now for the X component, I'll project onto the X axis. And notice that that X component lies along the plus X direction. So we'll put plus and the magnitude M2G. And if this is G2X, then this is also G2X. G2X is opposite the theta, so I will put in sine theta. Now, the normal force here points along the plus y direction, so I'll put in N2 and zero for the x component. Tension points along the minus x direction, so I will put in minus T for the x component and then zero for the y component. Moving along on our handout, we now have to apply the first condition of equilibrium, which says that if an object is not moving or moves in a straight line at constant speed, then the vector sum of all forces acting on the object is zero. Now, in this case, that's going to give us four separate equations. So the X components of the forces acting on one are gonna to sum to zero. The Y components of the forces acting on one will sum to zero. The X components of the forces acting on two sum to zero and the y components of the forces acting on two sum to zero. So that's four equations, So we're not gonna need all four. So let's start by writing down, let's start by applying the first condition of equilibrium to mass one. So that's going to give us two equations. So the sum of the x components of the forces acting on mass one is zero. So read along the top row and I get tension minus mu k n one equals zero, we can call that equation one. Now, the y components of the forces acting on mass one sum to zero. So we have the sum of the y components equals zero, add up along the bottom row and we get minus M1G plus N1 equals zero. Now, before proceeding to mass two, look at what we have here. Tension is unknown. Normal force one is unknown. Mass one is unknown. Normal force one is unknown. So we actually have three unknowns between these two equations. However, of those three, normal force one is one that the problem is not actually asking us for. So let's just eliminate that normal force one between these two equations so we don't have to fuss with it later on. 
So what I'm going to do here is solve equation two for normal force one and then substitute into equation one. Okay, so equation two tells us that normal force one equals M1G. We can call that equation three if we like. So now we're going to take this and put it into equation one. Okay, so we make this substitution right there, and we get tension minus mu k m1g equals zero. Or for later reference, let's write this as tension equals mu k m1g. Call that equation four. Now, there's two unknowns here. So at the moment, this doesn't let us solve for anything, but now let's go to mass two and see what that gives us. Okay, so if you look at what we have here, we are being asked to solve for the tension. Tension appears in the X equation, and there are no other unknowns in the X equation. So let's go ahead and sum the X components of the forces acting on mass two to zero. That will allow us to get the tension. Okay, so we have sum of the X components of the forces acting on mass two equals zero. Read across, that gives us M2G sine theta minus T equals zero. Or I guess we can take that tension, move it to the other side where it picks up a plus sign then flip sides to get tension equals M2G sine theta. So we can go ahead and make substitutions here. This would be three kilograms times at 9.8 meters per second squared times sine 40. And substituting. I get 18.9 newtons, or rather I should say, whoops, I should say 18.9, and then I have kilograms times meters per second squared, which you'll remember is a newton. So the tension is 18.9 newtons. Now the other thing we've been asked to solve for is mass one. Now to solve for mass one, we can use the equation we got by analyzing mass one. Okay, so by analyzing mass one, we were able to get this relation between tension and mass one. And now that we have the tension, we can use that to solve for mass one. So from equation four, we write mass one equals tension divided by mu kg. And now we wanna make sure the units come out correct. So let's just plug everything in with units as we are always supposed to do. Tension equals 18.9 newtons. Mu K is 0 0.25. And then G, 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so we're looking for units of kilograms. Now, notice we have newtons over meters per second squared. Is that the same as kilograms? Well, to see that, remember that a newton is a kilogram times meters per second squared. So when you write it out like that, meters per second squared cancels against meters per second squared. And you can see that we have the correct unit for the answer, kilograms. And when you put this in your calculator, I hope you find that mass one equals 7.71 kilograms. Okay, so now we have done a complete example involving two masses interacting with each other.